So hello and welcome to week two of our webinar series on the CISP. It's a short course presented by IT Masters in Charles Sturt University. Uh, you may have noticed your MC tonight is slightly less smooth tongue than our usual Guy Coward as he was unavailable. So instead you have me, Chantal Hale, IT Masters CEO and Education Manager. Our presenter tonight is Dr. George Thomas, IT Masters mentor and cybersecurity expert. All our webinars are held at 7.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And our aim tonight is to have the webinar go for about an hour with some time for questions at the end. You may remember from last week, um, but if we can have all the questions about content in the Zoom Q&A section so that we can ask George about them, and all admin co questions or comments that don't need to be addressed in the webinar can go into the comment section. As there are quite a lot of you tonight, um, we anticipate that we may not get to all of your questions. If you have anything that doesn't get answered tonight, they can be posted in the discussion forum so that we can get to them after. Tonight's webinar and all the webinars will be recorded and put up online on the learn.itmasters.edu.au site so that you can watch them later. Um, don't forget to turn your chat to all panelists, uh, to everyone, sorry, so that your fellow students can see your witty and intelligent comments. And with that out of the way, I think we can get started, George. All right, thanks, Chantelle. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. Welcome to week two. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for joining. And I guess you know we've got quite a lot of content to get through. As um, I know, some of so some of you had pointed out in the discussion forums, and I think I pointed it out earlier. You know, given that we have eight domains in the CSSP, um, and we have um, four uh, evenings to kind of get through it. Um, yeah, it's uh, there, there's quite a bit. So um, I'll get started. So um, I'm just looking. I mean, the, the count's going up. I mean, it, it will be recorded. So um, it looks like we have a pretty good attendance rate again. So um, tonight um, we're going to look at domain two and three. So domain two being asset security uh, and then domain three being security architecture and engineering. And so we'll look at some um, elements from both of those domains. Uh, as mentioned last week, um, if you're looking to um, you know, sit the exam um, and obtain the CSSP um, certification, then I would recommend um, getting a getting your hands on a copy of the official text, um, which is where uh, a lot of this content comes from and aligns with this content. Um, and so, as I said, this is one one of the texts. There, there's a few others. Uh, I used this one. I think I mentioned like I think it was second edition though, um, and found it to be really good with the test banks and so forth. So. Uh, feel free to grab a copy of that um, and it, it, uh, I found it helped. <laughs> so um, domain two, asset security. And so this, uh, I mean, this in, in you know, information security, cybersecurity land is, is critical, um, you know, knowing what you have, um, what it's worth um, and like, you know, how to, well, it's critical to knowing, you know, how to secure it. Um, and, and what needs to be done. And so I, you know, I'm sure some of you have heard that this, um, this before, but effectively, you know, it's the crown jewels. So knowing what your crown jewels are. Um, and I, um, you know, uh, I guess once you know what they are, then you know um, where they are, who has access to them and, you know, how to protect them. And so tonight what we'll do is we'll, we'll talk about, you know, identification and classification is probably a key element to this. Um, and so knowing your data is really important. So what is it? Where is it? What is its value? Um, and then looking at examples of things like sensitive data. And so, I mean, this isn't an exhaustive list of sensitive data, but some key, um, I guess, examples of types of sensitive data might be things like personally identifiable information, um, protected health information, and then proprietary data. So things like, you know, intellectual property, trade secrets, and, and things like that. Um, you know, in my sort of day-to-day -day job, I work in the um, data protection and privacy space at the moment. Um, and so there's a pretty big, um, you know, focus on things like PII and PHI, um, and obviously proprietary and confidential and other sensitive data. So um, now this isn't from the, um, the CSSP text, but I like to, and you know, for those of you that are um, based in Australia, um, I'm sure you're familiar with Telstra. <laughs> um, 
they have their five no's of cybersecurity, which I find um, really interesting. So the five no's um, are know the value of your data. So, you know, what is it worth? Um, know who has access to your data. And that can be internal, it could be external, like you know, partner organizations, it can be clients, it could be that sort of thing. Know where your data is. So, you know, um, like where is it physically located? You know, where is it logically stored? Um, you know, what region is it in like, geographically? Um, and, and, you know, and that stems to things like understanding, you know, what types of, um, you know, I guess, regulations and, and legislation and, and um, might apply to your data. Um, know who is protecting it. So who is the, you know, who, who are protecting your information? And that could be, like I said, that could be um, an internal resource or it could be a third party. Um, and then obviously knowing um, and understanding how well your data is protected. So as I said, this isn't something that you're going to find, um, what I think so anyway, on the exam, but I find it, you know, it's pretty useful to, to kind of, um, you know, look at these principles when it comes to the, you know, cybersecurity and your assets and, and knowing them. So um, as I said, this is a, a Telstra thing. So if you, you know, Google Telstra five nodes, you'll see this come up. Um, so it's been around a little while now, but yeah, it's a good, good reference point. Um, so as I said, um, knowing your assets and identifying them is really important. And then what happens is there's this concept around data classification. So this is where we start to get into the, you know, the kind of the meat. So this is very relevant for the CISSP. Um, in this example here, we've got uh, two, I guess, classification schemes. Um, one, and here we're looking at government versus non-government. I think it's important to point out pretty early on that given that the um, CSSP and IC squared is a US-based organization, that a lot of the emphasis here is going to be on um, classification schemes, for example, that are used in US government. Um, so on the left here, that's going to be kind of falling into that US government classification scheme. On the right is an example of more of a non-government scheme. Uh, Having said that, I mean, this isn't, um, so on the right, this um, public sensitive private confidential scheme, I mean, there are other schemes. Um, this, this isn't something that, um, you know, sorry, this is, I guess, customizable. It's based on, on organizations of what they want to label things. I mean, you know, this is a fairly standard approach having this kind of, these kind of four classifications, but I've seen, you know, three, sometimes even two to sort of simplify it. Um, but really it comes down to understanding the information that's there and, you um, and you know what level of sensitivity it is, and so when you think about um, you know public, and I'll, I'll kind of go to the to the right here, um, you know public, you know this is kind of like no damage um, public information, so something that might be you know marketing material or it might be something that's already in the public domain, you know that would be that would be public. Um, they're going up to you know sensitive. There might be some sensitivity to it, to it, so it might be just some like you know internal information. Maybe it's some you know an IP address. Thing, you know, maybe some IP addresses or some sort of information that's, you know, not for public consumption, um, but, you know, there might be some minimal kind of impact. And so that might be considered sensitive. And then you're kind of going up to, you know, private. Um, so this is where you might have, you know, maybe some information about partner organizations or, or, or things like that. And um, then all the way up to the, you know, the most strict or the most sensitive information being confidential. So, you know, this might be trade secrets, um, intellectual property. It might be financial information. It might be something about, you know, uh, um, an M&A transaction, you know, this sort of thing. And then, you know, similarly, um, you have that, that similar structure um, for government. And, you know, I know that, you know, probably a, a few of us, are, you know, and obviously I am located in Australia. So the Australian government have their own classification scheme, um, which um, funnily enough does does end in secret top secret, but starts with, you know, official, official sensitive, then goes up to protected um, and then secret and then top secret. So obviously top secret being, um, you know, classifications where, uh, classifications where there's, you know, um, potential damage to national security and things like that. Um, so, but yeah, from the, from the perspective of the CSSP um, is most likely gonna focus on these US-based classifications. And so there's a bit of a, I'm pretty sure I've shown this before, before I kind of explained it, but um, this diagram, which is taken out of the text. Um, and so here, you know, same thing, you've got unclassified or public being that kind of class zero. So, you know, no damage and then kind of working, you know, working the, the sensitivity levels up all the way to, you know, top secret or confidential proprietary and, um, 
you know, I guess non-government slash commercial land where, you know, we're talking exceptionally grave damage. So, you know, the impact of this would be um, very, very significant. And, you know, I've seen organisations also apply quantitative measures to this. So they might say, okay, well, this is going to be, you know, um, X billion or X million in um, damages and things like that. And so, um, you know, I've seen that sort of thing as well. So for each of those sort of classes or, or, or sensitivity levels, trying to assign a qualitative number, because as you can see, um, and, um, you know, qu uh, sorry, quantitative number, because as you can see, like qualitative figures, I mean, there's a bit of subjectiveness to it. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, so that's the, the data classification. I guess, you know, one of the key things is once um, assets have been um, identified. Um, and when I talk about you know, assets as well, it's important to note that you know, assets can be, uh, and in the context of information security, it's any type of information asset. So it could be um, you know, an individual um, you know, item, like a, a document or you know, a, a record of some description. Um, it could be a system, so an entire system. So you might say that you know, this system or this group of systems handle information that would be you know, classified as sensitive or confidential or depending on what industry you're in. Um, or it could be you know, a particular silo. So it might be a, you know, a database. So you know, this database contains information that is considered secret. So, um, and you know, I've done a lot of work in the ISO 27001 space. One of the critical things there is asset identification and classification. And so, you know, that's where you take a look at that. And depending on how granular you need to go, you might go really high level or you might go granular and say, okay, well, you know, this particular system is this and all these particular documents are this. And then going beyond that, there's the concept of, which isn't really covered in, in this deck, but the concept of labeling. So, you know, some of you may have seen if you've ever received a, a you know, a government based email or, you know, in some um, commercial organizations as well, you know, you might see something that will say like, you know, classification X or it, usually there's a, depending on where it is, there'll be like a, um, you know, SEC equals or a DLM equals, um, and then you'll see the classification. And so that <clears throat> is important because obviously it will identify the classification of whatever it is that, you know, you're looking at, but it also um, provides some, um, you know, identification mechanism for tools like data loss prevention or data leakage prevention, which we'll touch on um, shortly. So, cool. Uh, so that's data classification. Um, so data states, I guess it's important to understand the different um, data states. So data at rest, um, basically, it's not sleeping, but that basically when it's stored um, somewhere, usually on a disk of some description, um, that would be considered a data at rest state. Um, when data is being, you know, transported over a network or that, that's considered data in transit, sometimes it's referred to as data in motion, um, but that's the, um, <clears throat> that's what that state is. So it's being, you know, it's going over a network or the internet or whatever. Um, and then you've got data in use. And so that's usually considered, and, and to be honest, I normally hear the terms data in rest, uh, or sorry, data at rest, data in transit slash motion, used more often, but data in use is uh, used less often, but, you know, is more, uh, it's also called data in process, but it's data that's currently actively being um, processed. So if you think about an application, for example, that is um, taking a, I know, a file or piece of information off a disk, so it's taking it off an at rest source, it's then doing something with it, that would be data in use or data in process, and then it's sending it somewhere, that would be data in transit. So that's kind of that, that chain. Um, and I think, you know, I've got a point here is like, consider how one might protect confidentiality, integrity and availability in each of those data states. So and we could probably talk about that a little bit. Um, so data at rest, um, normally I have a bit of interactivity here, but with 700 people, it might be a bit hard. <laughs> so normally data at rest would be, you know, to, um, uh, controls like um, encryption, um, access control. In fact, encryption is going to be a big one, especially, um, you know, sorry, sorry, in, in, encryption, like disk encryption. Um, you know, when you think about like cloud platforms or things like that, I mean, that really is kind of the only control that you've got to protect that um, and to um, use for destruction, which we'll talk about later. 
Um, but you know, encryption is probably a big one in terms of protecting confidentiality and integrity. Um, and then availability is going to be things like you know redundancy, so fault tolerance on disks, um, replication, and that sort of thing. Um, data in transit, um, you're going to find again encryption is going to be heavily used in terms of ensuring confidentiality and integrity um, in in transit. Um, and then availability, um, you know, that's going to be things like um, you know the, the sort of you know QoS and and uh, potentially once again fault tolerance and, and things like that. Um, data in use, probably most likely going to be encryption again. So I think there's a theme here, which is that encryption plays a key part in a lot of this. Um, not availability, but at least from a confidentiality and integrity perspective. Um, and then availability is going to be more about redundancy and system, um, system fault tolerance. Um, but yeah, like kind of have a bit of a think about that and how the, that CIA triad applies to each of those data states. All right. Um, so as I said before, um, DLP, so DLP, uh, data loss prevention, sometimes called data leakage prevention. In fact, if I go back 10, 15 years, I always thought it was data loss prevention. And then suddenly I think people thought loss was like people were like just losing it. Um, so leakage kind of became, you know, another term that was used. Um, and there are really two types of DLP, right? So there's network-based DLP and endpoint-based DLP. And to go into a brief description of that, um, network-based DLP, you consider that as, um, as information that, and so what DLP does, sorry, DLP will inspect traffic, um, or inspect information and then monitor and apply rules, whether that be to audit or to block or to notify or to do multiple things. Um, and so, for example, you know, if you send something out and, you know, maybe it's got credit card numbers in it and you've got a rule that says, you know, detect and audit credit card numbers, then the DLP solution be responsible for that. Um, or, you know, if you detect more than X number of them, then block it and a DLP solution would, um, you know, provide controls for that. So network-based DLP is um, DLP that sits in the network. And when I say in the network, like it's somewhere within the, the, the sort of, you know, within the, the network infrastructure. So a lot of the time you see that in, you know, email-based systems, um, you see that in you know, sort of um, internet, uh, internet like edge systems, things like that. So there's like a DLP usually an appliance um, that will detect information as it's being transmitted over the network, apply those, oh, sorry, apply those rules and take whatever action um, needs to happen. Um, endpoint DLP, um, well, fundamentally does the same thing, but it's on the actual endpoint. So it might be on a, you know, a laptop, a workstation, a server. Um, you know, one of the benefits about that is when um, asset goes off network, I mean, yeah, possibly maybe everything is um, tunneled through VPN or through some sort of, um, uh, what do you call it, like proxy, um, but, you know, not always. So endpoint DLP will, will capture things like, like that. Um, and so, you know, that's the sort of two types of, of DLP um, solutions that are out there. Now, one of the key things is obviously DLP, as I said, can detect things like credit card numbers. It could detect certain types of, you know, PII. It could detect um, all sorts of stuff. And it's going to use rules. So it might use regular expressions. Um, it might have built-in rules that will say, okay, well, you know, it looks like this format looks like a, you know, a tax file number or a... Um, social security number, or it looks like credit card number, and like how many occurrences of it are there. And based on that, it will take some sort of action. Um, so the other thing is um, relying on things like labeling. So we talked about classifications earlier. Um, classifications could be applied to information, right? So let's say you label something as internal use only. Good example, internal use only. Someone tries to send it to, I don't know, the Gmail account. If it's clearly labeled as that, the DLP solution, would be able to pick it up and say, whoa, hang on, this is not allowed, and then take some sort of action. Same thing, you know, with, um, you know, confidential and that sort of stuff. Maybe it lets it go, maybe it doesn't, maybe it just, you know, monitors it. But what it does is it really, um, you know, provides compliance um, in terms of, you know, trying to monitor and control sensitive information and movement across networks and devices. Um, 
which kind of is my next point, which is why it's important. Um, because, you know, relying on just regular expressions um, and rules can be difficult. Um, and so, you know, applying, uh, and look, uh, to be completely honest, I mean, I'm not sure if a DLP solution that is 100% effective. I don't think there is one. I mean, no security control is really, you know, guaranteed to be 100% effective. Um, but, you know, it's going to catch, you know, the bulk of things providing it's configured properly. Um, the other um, sort of, I guess, element here is um, Cloud Access Security Broker or CASB. Um, and so what CASBs do is they specifically work with cloud technologies, generally speaking. Um, and I say that because I know there are some now that are kind of being able to work with on-prem um, platforms. But what a CASB does is it really, um, you know, hooks into a cloud solution, like an enterprise cloud solution, um, whether it be Microsoft 365 or Slack or um, SAP or whatever. Um, and the idea behind CASB is it enforces policy. So once again, you know, if there's a policy that says that, you know, such information will be encrypted or it won't be accessible outside of a particular network, then CASB can, you know, enforce those rules. Um, it can also be used for auditing and things like that. But um, I think one of the key things, which um, we probably will talk about in the security architecture part of this um, webinar is really around, you know, that sort of de defense in depth and multi-layered approach. And so this is where, you know, looking at multiple tools for data loss prevention, like um, obviously labeling and classification, but then, you know, endpoint DLP, network DLP and CASB, um, as well as other things like, you know, there's, you know, some organizations don't have the, the sort of budget to do that. So they might just do things like start to, you know, lock down access to USB ports and all sorts of fun stuff like that. So um, yeah, there's definitely that kind of multi-layered approach. Um, <clears throat> another important thing is um, data retention. So data retention is important um, because it can limit exposure. And, you know, I've been, uh, I mean, I, I've worked previously for many years with, um, within and with law firms. Um, so many of those you know, offer e-discovery um, or, you know, to, to sort of, you know, rely on it. Um, and one of the things here is that, you know, the, the key thing here is that um, having good retention policies and periods and you know, and being in being in compliance with those um, can help limit um, exposure, regulatory and legislative requirements, and 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 I can influence other things like BCPs, uh, so business continuity plans. Um, and so the idea here is that if there's no legal or legitimate reason to keep something, then consider getting rid of it. Because um, if I talk about e-discovery, as I said before if an organization is subject to an e-discovery, they're gonna get everything, even stuff that may no longer need to be maintained. Also, it increases the size of things like, you know, backups and, and maintenance around that and administration. And, and if you think about, you know, like technologies change and people used to use tape backups and now there's a lot of disk to disk stuff. I mean, if you don't need the tape backup stuff anymore because it's more than, you know, X years old and there's no regulatory or legislative requirement or policy requirement for it, then, you know, then you're maintaining legacy stuff that you don't need. Um, and so this is how this type of thing can influence um, business continuity plans. Um, and so when you do a, I mean, for anyone that's, I don't know if anyone's, you know, put together a, or done a, a BCP or developed a BCP, the first step of a business continuity plan is to conduct a, a generally to conduct a BIA, which is a business impact analysis. And so what you're looking at is, you know, critical systems and critical records and things like that, um, and what the impact is. And then that stems into, you know, building out the plan and what you need to have um, and what you need to stand up and, and what you need to do to ensure continuity with the business. So, you know, by retaining everything forever, um, even when not needed, you, you are potentially increasing that liability. So um, it's good to consider what you do and don't need. Um, so there's, there's a lot of benefits to, to data retention. Having said that, I know from experience, it can be a pretty tough nut to crack. So, um, I also hope that equally you've got your data retention in, um, you've got your policies going, you kind of worked it out. The next thing that you're probably going to need to do is destroy information. And so data needs to be destroyed appropriately. Um, so, and I'm sure many, if not all of you know that just going delete is not really a good way to destroy information. Um, it doesn't, usually doesn't actually destroy it. Um, and I won't get into, you know, how file allocation tables work and things like that, but there needs to be some really, um, 
you know, robust processes um, around data destruction. And so there's different methods of destruction um, depending on what type of system or storage medium it is. And so, you know, I've talked about encryption before and I'll touch on it again, but, you know, cloud systems versus magnetic media. Um, so, sorry, cloud obviously being cloud and magnetic media being, you know, tape, old school hard disks, you know, with the spindles. Um, solid state, which is the more, you know, flash type media. So, you know, USB flash sticks, your SSDs, um, and then obviously physical media. So by physical, um, we mean obviously anything that's tangible, but also paper. Um, paper would be considered a physical um, media. So there's different methods of that, and we will touch on this now. <clears throat> so a good place to start is some of the specifications. So NIST, so National Institute of Standards Technology, have SP888, which I think is probably now the, the kind of recommended go-to standard for data destruction. Um, previously, a lot of you know, guidance or a lot of um, organizations adopted the Department of Defense standard 5220.22-M. Um, and then you know, Australia, you've got the, um, uh, and look, the, the CSSP is probably gonna focus more on the NIST and, and possibly the DOD um, examples. Um, in Australia, if anyone's here, um, the ASD do have some guidance um, in their ISM. Sorry, it's the ACE, well, Australian government ISM now, but um, same thing, or well, it's not the same thing, but you know, same document um, and there's specific controls. And each one of those, just for completeness, um, when I look at those um, ISM controls there, actually focuses on different types of media. So one looks at magnetic, one looks at SSD, um, you know, volatile, but it's not volatile, that sort of thing. and it talks about, you know, things like number of passes, whether right um, zero, um, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Lost my train of thought, but basically zeroing out, that's what I was looking for, zeroing out a disk. And so, you know, for example, when we think about the old magnetic um, media, um, you know, multiple passes um, is recommended and, you know, completely zeroing out a disk. So zeroing out is where it just writes, you know, zeros or ones or, or other garbage over um, the sectors on the disk, right? Because, you know, deletion isn't, um, you know, there still might be residual data left. So there's some, you know, recommendations around that. Um, and then, you know, there's different methods. Um, so, you know, there's simple erasure, okay, cool, clearing, purging, and so we're starting to go down into the, the purging and the, and the sort of zeroing out, things like that. Um, and then you've got um, degaussing. So degaussing is really, um, a, a control that um, is only going to work on magnetic media. I don't know if anyone's ever used a degaussing wand. Um, normally I see like comments, but I can't see any of them. So, you know, degaussing wand, um, for anyone that's used one, basically uh, it's like an electromagnetic, um, it's like a pulse, I guess, and it just like scrambles whatever's on there. I don't know if you use one on a TV, the old CRTs, and it just bends everything. So that's a way to destroy magnetic media. Um, physically destroying, so, you know, like literally, burning it, <laughs> um, turning it to dust. Um, you know, I'd probably argue that just kind of whacking it with a brick is probably maybe not that effective, especially in the case of solid state. Um, but yeah, physical destruction is what destroying is. Um, in the case of physical media, I mean, that's going to be shredding and cross-cut shredding. So that's not just turning it into thin strips, but also cutting cross-cut the other way, um, and then potentially turning it into powder. Um, and then one of the key, I guess, controls, especially around cloud is um, the use of crypto shredding. So crypto shredding is the only way to have some comfort that um, information stored on, uh, information stored at rest or previously stored at rest in a cloud environment has been um, adequately destroyed. And that relies on um, encryption of that information at rest but also relies on the ability to revoke um, encryption keys. And so um, we are gonna talk about cryptography very shortly. Uh, and, and effectively the way that, it, and so it's probably, hopefully it'll um, we'll cover a little bit more shortly, but the way this works is when you think about encryption, the use of a key to you know, encrypt, so you know, take an algorithm, put a key in it, use the key plus the data to encrypt the, um, uh, uh, sorry, the, the key plus the algorithm to encrypt the data. Um, without that key, you can't decrypt. 
So the idea of crypto shredding is by destroying that, just simply destroying that key. And then, you know, the, the concept here is that by that key being destroyed, no longer available, you can no longer decrypt the information and therefore it's considered crypto shredded. So that's, um, that's crypto shredding. All right. Um, Before you move on, um, I thought it might yeah, be cool. just good I was to about get to, pause to some of the questions. Um, yeah. uh, and my apologies, Guy has this amazing ability to work out what questions might be relevant and I definitely don't have it. So I'll ask some of them. We won't have time for all of them. Uh, my apologies if we don't get to your questions. I'm sure they're all valuable. I just don't know which ones are as much as Guy would. Um, so somebody had asked way earlier on, is the five no's similar to the essential eight? Telstra are pushing us to meet the essential eight model. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll, explain, I'll explain that a bit more. So the, no, they're, they're, they're a bit different. So the, the five no's is really about data and specifically about um, the data itself. Whereas the essential eight, so the ACSC essential eight, previously the ASD essential eight, are eight mitigating controls that um, are designed to protect an organization from, and I don't remember the exact number, but it used to be a certain percentage of technical based attacks. And so for anyone that's not familiar with the essential eight, um, and you're gonna test me now, um, you know, application whitelisting, um, patching of applications, patching of operating system, He's out of order, by the way. Um, Multi-factor authentication, daily backups, hardening of end-user applications. We'll look up to six. Um, uh, wait, uh, off disabling off or not disabling office macros, but controlling office macros to use any trusted inside macros. Oh my god, I've got one more. Um, <laughs> oh, I hate that. Put myself on the spot. What have I missed? Maybe someone else knows. I've missed one. I know that because it's eight, right? Um, that's really about preventing um, technical threats. So that's, um, did I say restricting administrator privilege? I can't remember. Um, so yeah, that, that's slightly different. So yeah, one's focused on data, one's focused on preventing technical threats. And so when you think about things like, as an example, ransomware, um, you know, the essential eight is a really good set of controls to prevent that. Because if you think about how ransomware works, okay, so someone um, might remote desktop or remote access your organization. It's going to be hard if you've got you know, the MFA control in. They're probably going to use some sort of exploit. It's going to be harder if you've patched everything. Um, they're going to run a crypto locker piece of software. Once again, it's going to be really hard if you've got app white listing in, I guess that kind of, you know. And then let's say they are successful. Well, you know, hopefully you've got your backup, which is control eight. So that's kind of how I sort of explain that. So yeah, a little bit different. Okay. Um, we had a few questions about the difference between this version of the CISP and the later, the earlier versions. And I just thought possibly you touched on it last week, but I just touch on it again. We're redoing this short course. We did it a few years ago with the older version of CISP because there is a decent amount of new stuff is my understanding. There's quite a few. So the um, so the previous uh, course was I think 2013 from memory. Um, there's been um, a change in domains since then. So two domains have dropped. Um, when I say two have dropped, so sorry, it decreased in number, but there's also been some changes to the domains. Um, and really, the way that you know what, what ISC squared have done is they uh, and there's been iterations between now and then as well. So back in 2013, it was ten domains, and prior to that. Um, I think it's 2014, 2015, I can't quite remember, but they went down to eight domains. There's been um, iterations between then and now as well, where what they're doing is the content um, of the CISP has been, I guess, um, adjusted to meet, you know, the, the industry and, and, and the requirements of the industry. So obviously, you know, now there's much more focus, for example, on cloud. And yeah, I get, you know, there's, there's, there's the CCSP, which is really specialized in cloud, but you know, you probably wouldn't have seen anything about, for example, you know, cryptographic shredding, um, you know, 12 years ago. So there's just been changes along the way. There's been, you know, some significant change and then there's been incremental changes throughout. Um, I, I actually did try and locate, see if anyone had like a complete, what's all the stuff that's changed in the last 10 years, but no one really had. Um, I mean, there was some people that had called out, you know, um, things like, you know, infrared security. You know, I think that might have been one that might have been 10 years ago and like no one uses that now. So it's not really in there anymore, things like that. So they just kind of removed the old and 
make sure the news in there and that it's current. Makes sense. Um, uh, touching on data classifications, you mentioned top secret, etc. Does having a clearance help with jobs that don't necessarily require it? How common are jobs needing a clearance? How common are jobs needing a clearance? Um, that's a little bit how long is a, a piece of string. Um, I mean, so it really depends what type of information you're going to be handling and what type of job it is. Um, I know, as an example, anyone that's going to be working in government, um, and depending on what agency it is, clearance is going to be helpful. Once again, depending on what agency it is and what type of information they handle. Um, also, in some industry organisations that um, provide services to government, um, you know, I've, I've been in that boat. Clearance, um, clearance is useful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a useful thing, um, especially because for anyone that's um, gone through it, um, especially as a non-government person, it could be. It's actually quite difficult to get, um, and depending on what clearance level it is, the process is um, can be quite taxing. Um, in, in fact, like if, if you go to um, uh, what is it, oh, uh, VP? No, sorry. Uh, AG, AGS, AGVSA, Australian Government Vetting Security Agency. Um, they kind of give you an, a, a bit of a, this is all the stuff that we look at. And if you, you'll see, like, if you're going to go up to, um, you know, negative vetting or positive vetting that, you know, it's a lot of um, information that they ask for, for, you know, effectively your entire life. So it can be quite invasive for some people. So, um, and so some people don't want it or, you know, and, and it can take a long time. It can take months to get. So it's definitely a, uh, if you're looking to do any work with government, I would say um, it's definitely something I'm like useful to have, whether you're in government or or going to go into government, or whether it's a um, you know a external organisation that might be providing services to one to an agency. Great. I'll just ask one more question, then we can continue on, just so that we're not here all night. Um, and again, I apologise if I don't get to your questions. We'll try and get to them on the forums. It's just there's so many of you. Um, with so many different cloud-based services available, how effective are DLP solutions in the real world and how much should organisations rely on these controls? Um, so this is where, you know, you, you start to look at things like CASB. Um, so it's a good question um, because, yeah, DLP really, and I guess I kind of alluded to a little bit, works best um, on your endpoint or within network. Uh, but when you've got a trusted application, like an enterprise application um, that you've provisioned for the purposes of um, using it, for example, maybe it's Office 365 um, or Slack or whatever, um, you're going to allow that system generally to accept information from within your network. You're going to say, okay, well, you know, even if it's sensitive, let's say you know, you've vetted the cloud app and it all meets all your security requirements, you're probably going to store stuff in there. So... At this point, you need to start relying on things like CASB. Um, and so, as I said, CASB, Cloud Access Security Broker, is, you know, it's going to have policies in it. It's going to hook into that cloud system and it's going to enforce those policies. Um, and so, as I said, if you're accessing it, for example, off network, um, CASB is going to say, hey, well, depending on how it's configured, you're not allowed to do this. Um, so it's going to provide some level of DLP control now, one of the challenges is that, you know, not every CASB supports every cloud-based application, which I think is a, probably another point that the person's probably thinking right now, which is absolutely true. So that has to be part of that overall design when you're thinking about, um, you know, security architecture, um, that sort of, or, or, and, you know, solution architecture in general, having that security discussion at the beginning of the design phase is critical because it's like, okay, we're thinking about this. Great. So what are security requirements? Does our CASB solution, do we have a CASB solution? If we do, or if it's the one we're looking at, does it work? And don't get me wrong. I mean, a lot of um, cloud vendors are working with CASB developers um, and you know, those libraries are getting increased all the time. So it's a lot better than what it was. Um, and obviously the more kindly widely adopted mainstream CASB providers support generally more applications. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a consideration, but and one that's really important from a, um, you know, a, a solution architecture perspective. Great. Um, we'll let you get on with the presentation. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible at the end with the time allotted. Cool. I've been, I've been through all these headaches before.
<laughs> so, uh, as in, you know, trying to make sure stuff works and policies are applied and all that sort of fun thing. So anyway, it's good timing that when you kind of said, oh, let's stop here because we're at domain three. Um, and hey, that CASB thing is probably a little bit of a, a good segue here because we've talked about security architecture and engineering. Um, so yeah, timing. Um, so I guess the first thing, and I touched on it earlier, is uh, a key element here is going to be cryptography. Um, and I remember, I mean, I remember when I went through the CISP, CISSP stuff early on, I mean, cryptography was a pretty big chunk of it. Um, even, I mean, and it still is today. I mean, it's fundamental to, to um, information security and cyber security. Um, ooh, look at it, it says that there, fundamental protection mechanism. And so what it does is, you know, it helps protect confidentiality and integrity, um, availability, maybe not as much, but um, but yeah, confidential integrity is probably a key thing when it comes to cryptography. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are probably a couple key terms here. So there's two types of, I guess, you know, encryption that you know that, you know, that we um, that we cover. So there's symmetric encryption, uh, and we'll dig into these in the following slides in a little bit more detail. There's symmetric encryption, and then there's um, asymmetric encryption. Uh, and then we'll also talk about the difference between encryption and hashing. So symmetric encryption. So symmetric encryption uses a shared key that's available to all users. Um, the, and so what that means is um, when you encrypt something, you use a key, you know what the key is, and whoever you share that information with, you give them the key. And then they use the same key to unlock the information and decrypt it. Um, it is um, it is the best performance, right? So there, and I'll get into why that is in a minute. So from a performance perspective, symmetric encryption is going to perform the best. So it's going to be very useful for things like large files, right? And 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 things where there's like you know heavy um, sort of you know I guess file transmission and things like that. That's where symmetric encryption is going to be really useful. And you've probably heard of some of these before. Um, Advanced encryption standard AES is probably the you know kind of industry standard best practice um, uh, algorithm at the moment. Uh, data encryption standard DES, which is you know got some um, I think known vulnerabilities, and you've probably heard of like triple DES, which is three DES. Um, there's you know international data encryption algorithm IDEA, Blowfish, um, and the rest of uh, Cipher. And some of these are you know when when you think about what you're going to use today. Um, I would definitely go with AES because some of those others have um, vulnerabilities within them that have been identified. Um, if you think about you know, encryption at rest, so encryption on a disk, so for example, BitLocker in Windows, um, that uses AES. Um, and so when you think about, well, who's exchanging the key, the way that that works is um, the key is generated. So on a boot drive, so the C drive, the, the, the key is generated and stored in, a, um, in a, a, a TPM, so a trusted platform module, which is a piece of hardware that's on the motherboard of, of your laptop um, and it's stored in there. And as the machine boots, that key is then extracted and used to unlock the drive. Um, you know, if you're doing BitLocker on a USB key, you could just, you know, you'd set a password and that would be, um, you know, that would be you knowing what that, what that key is. So um, yeah, BitLocker is going to use um, AES, um, as I said, Pretty, pretty standard. Um, even things like TDE, which is transparent data encryption on you know, SQL Server databases also uses, um, uses AES. So that is the kind of de facto standard um, algorithm today. So um, AES usually um, 128 was kind of the, at least bare minimum. Um, 256 bit keys is kind of, you know, best practice and then you can get up to 512 and so forth. Obviously the, the bigger the key, the, the performance is slightly impeded, but um, still, I mean, yeah, 256 or 120 and above is, is recommended. Um, cool, so then we have asymmetric encryption. So this is, this is different. Um, there is no um, actual kind of key exchange. So, and I'll get to that second bullet point in a minute. Um, so the way that this works is asymmetric encryption uses um, math, basically. Um, it derives keys from things like prime numbers or from prime numbers. Um, and the way it works is um, no, using mathematics, the, those keys are, are, um, are, are derived. Um, and so there's the concept of a public and a private key pair. Uh, and the way that that works, I'm just kind of trying to look at my 
forward slide just so I want to ex like explain it and then it's probably got a diagram but I'll do it anyway so um, if you can imagine there's a public and a private key um, and if I am going to exchange a piece of information with another party um, I'm going to use their public key to encrypt information and they can only decrypt the information using their private key um, that's kind of how asymmetric encryption works um, it is commonly used for things like secure key exchange. Um, and so, you know, when we think about, um, you know, like, uh, and, and I just realized hybrid encryption isn't really covered here, but something like a TLS connection on a, um, uh, on a web server, so transport layer security is an example of hybrid encryption. So what happens here is a key exchange happens using asymmetric, um, so asymmetric does its math. It does a, a key exchange for a session key, which is obviously very small. So performance isn't that much of an issue. Um, and then once the connection is established, you're starting to transfer large amounts of data, but a key exchange has been done to then enable symmetric encryption. Um, as it says here, the performance is a lot slower because there's a lot of mathematical um, processing in order to drive these keys. Um, and then you, you know you probably see some of these very familiar algorithms here. So um, RSA, probably that are still the most widely adopted um, algorithm. DSS, which is digital signature standard, which was, um, uh, I guess it's a, uh, the, the older obsolete version was DSA, which is very similar to RSA. It was developed, I think, by the US government. Um, I think the benefit of DSS is decryption is slightly faster, um, whereas decryption is slightly slower with RSA, um, but generally RSA is, is used. Um, and then you've got things like elliptical curve, cryptography, um, which is starting to make a bit more of a, you know, becoming a bit more present. Um, and so the big thing here is, you know, there's this whole public key infrastructure or PKI, uh, which is what, you know, this is kind of referred to with all these, um, you know, uh, certificates and, 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 you know, having, um, you know, if you think about when you, uh, and certificate trusts and things like that. So, um, but yeah, it's commonly referred to as PKI. When you're thinking about infrastructure that uses this sort of asymmetric um, certificates of encryption. So, to have a diagram, which I think I just explained, but anyway, so, um, so if you think about it, um, P is plain text, C is ciphertext, so P is the you know readable version, C being ciphertext, so the encrypted version. Um, and so what happens is the sender uses the receivers, I knew I was gonna explain this and then there's a better diagram. Um, the, the sender takes the plain text, so whatever, hello, um, uses the encryption algorithm, so, uh, RSA takes the receiver's public key to encrypt it. So now it's encrypted text. That's then transmitted. So it's secure because it's encrypted. And then the receiver uses their own private key to decrypt it. So I guess one of the key issues here is there needs to be some um, exchange of these, these keys. I don't know if anyone's ever used SMIME um, or email certificates. Um, you know, this could be quite challenging because you've got to kind of do the exchange of, of certificates so that the other person has access to the public um, key of the of the recipient. Um, so that could be a bit of a bit of a pain point. Um, you know, in a web server's example, the public key is available on the web server. Um, so the the browser would have access to the public key on the web server. It would encrypt the data, send it over, and then the private key is installed on the web server, which would then be used to decrypt. So you know, and that's how that works. Um, and then, as I said, you know, you've got things like hybrid encryption um, as well. So it's a very um, useful diagram there. Um, hashing, so that's encryption very quickly, very, very quickly, it's encryption. So hashing, so um, hashing is, so with encryption, you encrypt stuff, you decrypt stuff, providing you have the keys. Um, hashing is one way and it's theoretically irreversible. And so um, hashing is uh, commonly used in things like password systems. So people think, oh, you encrypt passwords. Well, generally you should be hashing passwords so that passwords can't be decrypted. Although some systems do encrypt them and I kind of think that's not good because you shouldn't be able to decrypt passwords. Um, Active Directory in, the, in you know, Microsoft Windows land uses hashing to store its passwords. Um, now, Hashing, you know, there's a few hashing algorithms. I've got a couple of examples here. So SHA, so secure hashing algorithm and MD5. Um, what that does is um, when you take an input and 
you hash it, um, you will get a fixed length output. Now, because it's using this algorithm, no matter how many times you hash it, if you're hashing the same piece of information, it's going to output the same hash. So, you know, this is useful for anyone that's, you know, downloaded an ISO image, you'll see sometimes there's a checksum and there's a hash. And the idea behind that, and this is like testing integrity, is that you download the ISO image, you run a, you know, if you're running Windows, you do like um, get dash file hash in PowerShell, space dash algorithm, space SHA-256, space file name, press enter, spits out a hash, you compare that um, with, um, What's on the what they what the publishers put on their website? If they're the same, you know that it hasn't been tampered with. Um, for all those you know Mac Linux users out there, OpenSSL, um, DGST space dash. Uh, oh, sorry, it's space char two fifty six file name same thing, same output. Um, and yeah, you do it on Windows, you do it on Mac. I mean, the, or you do it on Linux. The hash is going to output the same. So, fundamental problem here: the hash is the same. So, if you think about Active Directory as an example. Um, if someone's storing a password, I don't know, password one, terrible password, don't use it, but password one, the hash of password one, no matter where it's stored in any Active Directory system is going to look the same. So this is that whole concept of rainbow tables and, um, and being able to, you know, brute force hashes. And so, you know, downloading a Active Directory dump of, of hash passwords and comparing that to known hashes is a way that a threat actor might be able to identify what passwords actually are. Uh, and so this is where the concept of salting comes in. Um, unfortunately, Active Directory doesn't salt. So salt is, um, imagine salt, is adding arbitrary, um, you know, additional, uh, I guess, data into, a, um, into a, 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 a password and then hashing it. Uh, and then that, that salt is stored so that it can be you know, inputted later for doing comparisons. But what it does is it creates a unique hash um, and so what that means is if someone in you know, a good password system or a good system where, you know, well, yeah, a good password system, you would hash and salt. So that way that, you know, even if password one was used three times, the hash would look different and it would not look like anything that was, you know, available on you know, the dark web or a password dump uh, or a rainbow table because, you know, they would need to have both the hash and salt identical. So that's the concept of salting. So that would be the best practice is to salt hashes. Um, Cool. Um, great. So encryption keys. Okay, so let's talk about encryption keys. As I said, this is a fundamental part of um, crypto shredding. Um, in fact, it should be a fundamental part of, of, of any type of encryption, right? And so I've seen situations where, you know, encryption keys, especially in cloud systems, are the same across multiple users, especially in multi-tenant environments that, you know, might share one database or one store, and this is not good. I mean, usually there's um, reasons for it, which, you know, eh, I'll save my comments, but, <laughs> but um, you know, having um, unique encryption keys for a particular tenant, and there's this concept of um, CMEC or um, custom managed encryption keys or BYOK, bring your own key, um, where, you know, many software vendors or many cloud vendors now allow you, and I would strongly recommend getting something that has customer managed encryption or being, bring your own encryption keys. Um, because what it does, it means that your data is encrypted using your own keys that you manage. Um, or, and in the event that you need to, that you can revoke. Um, and you could, there might be a multitude of reasons why you need to revoke. Maybe the relations come to an end, you, you want to sanitize all the information, you want to crypto shred it. Maybe you suspect there's some sort of, you know, disclosure or breach, or you know, maybe it's too late for that, but you know, there might be a reason why you want to do that. And if you don't have access to, to be able to revoke the keys, um, you can't securely destroy the data that's um, in the cloud. But this goes also for you know, anything um, that's stored um, uh, you know, like on disk. So you wanna destroy it, um, destroy the keys. So, and then obviously there's some really important um, elements around key management. Oh, and sorry, obviously in terms of key size, the longer the key, um, the more secure in general the key is, provided it is a truly random key. So it needs to be a, a, a randomized key, not just like you know, something that's you know, predictable or, or, or you know, that sort of thing. Um, so you know, in terms of key management, I mean, there's gonna be processes around key management um, around. And, and so I, 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 you know, the, the recommendation is to generally 
um, develop um, procedures around key management, around how keys are generated, how they're stored, you know, making sure they're stored securely. I'm so sorry, generation, making sure they're truly random keys, how long the keys need to be. Storage in terms of, you know, how the keys are stored, how they're securely stored, how the keys are exchanged, so they're securely exchanged, um, and then how keys are replaced, because keys should be periodically replaced um, at certain intervals. Um, I'm going to say at a bare minimum at least once a year, but more often if possible, um, depending on the sensitivity of information, um, and then how to revoke keys and in what situations are keys revoked uh, and things like that. So, um, yeah, encryption keys uh, are a critical part of encryption. Um, so in terms of secure design principles, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll talk about a few things here. So secure defaults. So there's a lot of movement towards this. I remember, you know, going years back, I asked questions of a, a vendor. I'm like, why? You know, you've got all these um, security controls, but you don't have them on. And they're like, oh, yeah, because, you know, it's going to impact things like user adoption and stuff like that. But there is now more of a movement towards secure by default because, you know, the, the, the rate of um, adoption of, of technologies and the number of breaches because things weren't secured by default has really started to force the issue and now secure by default is far more um, prevalent. So, you know, secure by default would be having, you know, the minimum sort of um, services enabled. It would be having things like, you know, uh, you know MFA enabled by default, you know, strong policies enabled by default um, rather than having to do it after the fact. Um, failing securely, that's around, you know, if there's an error or some issue or there's a failure that, um, that, that if that fail happens, that the, the system is secure. Um, so if you think, you know, think for example, a, 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 an electronic lock, um, if the power fail, now obviously there's, there's potentially occupational health and safety issues around this, um, but let's say there was no threat to life, um, maybe the requirement there is if the power fails, that it fails locked rather than fails open. Um, I guess it's a situation here might be you know, error handling. So, you know, there might be a, you know, making sure that, you know, it, it fails securely so it can't be exploited. Um, zero trust is something that is becoming, um, you know, more widely adopted. So this is where nothing inside the organization is trusted. So unlike before, behind the corporate firewall, every device, you know, can kind of trust every other device. Zero trust is where there's effectively a, a, a firewall around every single asset, whether it be inside or outside of the firewall. Um, and so, you know, this helps prevent things like lateral movement. So if a threat actor gets into a particular asset, they can't get into anything else because nothing else trusts whatever. So, you know, it makes it a lot more difficult from a threat actor perspective. Um, and they use this, you know, this word uh, micro segmentation. That's another sort of zero trust type um, thing where you're basically saying, you know, you're micro segmenting um, into these little containers. Um, privacy by design, something that I probably have a lot to do with, but you know, this is around, uh, we talked about secure um, solution architecture, but privacy by design is similar in that privacy is considered um, at the early stage of a project um, to avoid privacy violations. I mean, anyone that's familiar with GDPR, like this is a major requirement of GDPR, making sure that privacy is considered early on and throughout the life cycle. Um, so that's privacy by design. And then you've got the, the trust but verify. So, you know, uh, I guess, you know, many organizations trust internal entities. It can lead to things like insider issues. Um, and so adding things like, you know, access controls and NAP and NAC and, and this is really kind of a bit more the opposite of zero trust. Um, but, you know, having a, a level of trust but then verifying that trust is, is um, the sort of trust by verify principle. So, all right. Do any more questions? Because uh, I'm going to get into all the fun stuff like security models in a second. And okay, well, we have a few questions. I just want to make sure that I'm, you know, not wasting any time, and I'm trying to babble for a second so you have a chance to drink your water. Um, uh, how about this one? Should organisations use a different approach to handling data which is only sensitive for a finite period of time, e.g., market sensitive data which is highly confidential until publicly announced? So what was that? So they have a what approach, sorry? A, a different approach. To how they handle that data? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think they would handle it differently. Um, so while it is sensitive, and we will talk, once again, these are really good because this is like kind of segue into security models that we're going to talk about in a minute, um, is 
when that information would be classified as sensitive, it would be handled differently because it has a different classification level. So it should be handled in accordance with the requirements for information of that sensitivity and value. So I think the answer is yes, because then what happens is when it becomes public data, then it would essentially be declassified, right? It would go down to the, well, unclassified level, in which case those security controls and the cost and effort associated with protecting that is no longer required. So I think if I mentioned the question correctly, yes, it would be handled differently. It would be handled with the controls that um, uh, are required for that sensitivity. And then it would effectively be declassified and then those that you know would no longer be required. So you would handle it based on the sensitivity, which would therefore make it different. Great. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that we're asking questions about the content rather than the exams, et cetera. Um, sorry, I had questions listed to ask, but then I didn't ask them. Uh, how can you determine the actual risk of cloud storage with cloud storage of data when you must trust the integrity and capabilities of an external provider? Um, well, I don't know if the answer is you must do that. <laughs> I think there's a, a big portion of, um, or a big element of due diligence. Um, and so, I mean, you say you must trust them, but I think it would be prudent to do due, due diligence, do a security review. Um, I've spent many hours um, giving cloud vendors a hard time um, because I just, and, and to the point where if they don't come to the party, it's like, well, you know, is the risk too great to do this? So, you know, there's going to be some not negotiables. And I think having a solid um, policy or framework around both the sensitivity of data. So, and this is how I've done it. Um, in the past is you have the classification of data. So let's say it's confidential or, or unclassified. What are the controls that are required in order to protect that information? And do, does my cloud provider meet that? Um, so as an example, if it's going to be highly confidential information, is there encryption at rest? Um, is there encryption key management? Is there um, encryption in transit? Uh, is secure coding practice? Do they have formal certification attestation, e.g. SOC 2 type 2, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Do they have ISO 27001? Do they align with the Cloud Security Alliance um, CCM? Do they have an attestate? Oh, do they have a, a, you know, what do you call it? Uh, CCIQ, come on. Anyway, so there's this big portion of doing um, effectively, you know, what we call supply chain risk, right? So there's this supply chain risk review process where what you're doing is you're making sure that that, that cloud provider meet your security requirements and where they don't then this is where it becomes another discussion in terms of well when can they do that and if they can't um what is the risk of that and if the risk is too high then maybe you don't do that or you know in rare circumstances where you don't have a choice um there might need to be some you know go to senior management go to approval look at what are the compensating controls you can put in there is there another way that you can protect it so there's a it's 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 a bit of a you know, it's a bit of a, an exercise, I think. Um, but yeah, certainly I, I would. And look, the, the big cloud providers um, do have a lot of, um, they've put a lot of work into their, you know, privacy and security and, and, and um, you know, independent verification and attestation and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, there's, there is that as well. But yeah, due diligence, I think, is the key. I'll, go, I'll ask one more question and then we can move on. So we're not here all night. Um, if you were to use a bring your own key system, would that possibly make your data more susceptible to destruction in a cloud environment? Instead of requiring a piece of wiper software to dodge an AV solution during deploy and run, being able to simply revoke the keys seems like a more reliable and permanent method. That was a really long question. Can I see that question? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's in the Q&A section it's asked by Stuart at 829 820 got it if you were to use a bring your own key would that possibly make the data in a cloud environment piece of wireless software um, well no so your your key um, so your key management solution is generally if you especially if you manage it is going to be um, separated right so you're going to have a key appliance 
somewhere, generally speaking. I mean, there might be like, a, I've, I've heard the term customer lockbox, um, but, you know, the, and, and these are appliances, right? So it's not like that, you know, it would be easy to get onto that. Um, so for example, when I've done it before, you know, we've got one tenant, so the cloud solution provider provides you their tenant. And then I've got like a key management appliance that's sitting in a completely different place. Uh, the only thing that can happen is the keys become generally unavailable. Um, the data doesn't get destroyed. It just means it can't be decrypted until that key management device comes, um, you know, come, comes um, back online. Um, look, the piece of wiper software is still gonna work if it somehow got into that cloud system, whether it revoked your keys or not. Um, it would just wipe encrypted data, um, which then it's still gone. So yeah, I think unless um, someone were able to get into your key management system, which is why it's really important, why I said earlier, you need to have really um, good processes and, and requirements around securing those keys. Um, unless, yeah, if someone got in there and revoked that key, that would be very, very bad. Um, so there needs to be obviously an emphasis on securing that system too. But generally it would be less obvious where that is. So, you know, as I said, might be obvious where your tenant is and where your data is, but it might be less obvious where your key management system is. But I think the, the, the thing here is make sure that your keys are also secured properly. That makes sense. All right, I'll keep going. All right, uh, where are I? Security models. All right, we'll talk about some of these. So, um, God, I wish I knew pronounce half of these. Um, so security models, um, so these are models and some of these I'm gonna kind of use some examples and. Hopefully it'll make a bit more sense uh, for anyone that's not familiar with them. So Bell Lapadula, Lapadula, Bieber, um, not the singer, um, Clark Wilson, Bruno Nash, and, and there's a few more. So we'll, we'll talk about these. I mean, these are, I remember talk, I remember these in um, when I went through this <laughs> it's just the, um, how do I get rid of this thing now? There we go. So Bell Lapadula, Lapadula, um, so this is uh, originated from the um, from MITRE, so um, as in MIT, um, uh, I can't remember, RE stands for, but MIT basically, um, back in the 1970s, and it is uh, it is used in government, military, um, uh, I guess that's where it's widely used. So it stems from classifications. I'm going to try and explain this in a minute. So you've got this concept of no read up and no write down. Um, and that might be like, what does that mean? So I kind of need to go back a little bit to the diagram. So if I think of it, just remember, no read up, no write down. So we're always like 25. So then you go all the way back. No read up, no write down. Okay, here we are. So no read up, no write down. So let's say that you are authorized to be able to access confidential, so here, confidential information. Now, no read up. That means that you are not allowed to read up to secret. That makes sense. So if you've got confidential access only, and that's your highest level of clearance, you cannot read up. So you can't get anything out of secret. Um, you also cannot write down. So you can't take something that's confidential and declassify it and put it in unclassified. So that makes sense. So if you think about the inverse of that, um, you can write up and you can read down. So that also makes sense. So if you've got confidential access, even though you can't declassify something, you can read stuff that is below your level. Um, what you can also do is you can save stuff up to a more um, uh, sensitive level. So you can write up to secret, but you can't read it. So that's how that model works. Cool. Hope that makes sense. That's how I like to explain it with the picture because it kind of makes a bit more sense when you're saying, okay, well, you can't read anything higher than you, you can't declassify, you can write higher than you, and you can read down. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna go back to slide 25. I don't know if there's a quicker way to do that, but, um, so that's that model. Um, now you've got the, um, the, the Bieber model. So this is an integrity model. So Bell doesn't deal with integrity. Um, so this model was created, the, the Bieber model, um, and what it does is it addresses that issue with um, what they call it the star property, um, which does not restrict uh, writing to a more trusted object. So subjects can't read um, objects of lesser integrity and they cannot write to objects of 
higher integrity. So this is talking about integrity now um, rather than um, confidentiality. And so the way that this is often um, used because you know this focuses on integrity is it's combined with another model that provides confidentiality and you end up with the Lipner model. Um, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail unless it's conscious of time, but just be familiar with these models. There's my tip. Clark Wilson, I think many have probably used something that follows this model. Um, it's an integrity model and it allows modification only through a limited slash controlled interface. So if you think about a client um, that has a, a, an interface or a portal, and then there's a database. So when I say that, what, what I'm saying here is you don't interact directly with data. So there's something in between. Um, and so it was designed to protect integrity, but it can easily be adapted to limit access. So an application, you know, with that kind of almost like that multi-tier application where you've got a, uh, an interface um, or portal that's doing you know, some level of validation and some level of access control, and there's a database sitting behind it, and then you're the client sitting at the front, that's an example of using the um, Clark Wilson model. We're almost there, by the way. Um, and so we've also got the, uh, the, the Brewer Nash model, um, so this talks about you know access control changing downlink based on user activity. Ethical walls are an example of this model. Um, you know things that are sensitive to conflicts of interest. So for example, someone works at a, a company, I'll say company data agency, who has access to proprietary data for company A, um, and they should you know not be allowed to access similar data for company B if those two companies compete with each other. So that the dealing of that would be using something like the um, the Brewer Nash model. Cool, um, I blew through that one, but um, but that's it. Okay, cool. So um, if you've got the book, chapters five to nine, we'll cover all of that if you wanna read a lot more. Um, but yeah, I guess we could do a little bit of Q and A. I oh, know we just stopped, but I talk a lot. So I'm getting a bit of a dry scratchy throat. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to think of what we can talk about so that you can have a drink. Before we get to the Q and A and put questions in the Q and A, even if I'm not gonna get to them tonight, um, but before we get to the q and I thought I'd just touch base to remind you that you can find these recordings at learn.itmasters.edu.au or on our YouTube page and that the discussion forums will be there to answer any questions that we don't get time to tonight. I'm just trying to make sure that everything we're asked is a little bit more relevant at the time if possible. Um, and so now the hard part where I have to work out what questions to ask out loud <laughs> um, how about is asymmetric encryption perform performance ever really an issue on modern platforms? Yes, um, <laughs> and I know, I'm going to say that. I know that's my very short answer. Um, yes, but there's a big fat but. It depends on the size of what you're encrypting. So if you're talking about like small bits of data, then absolutely not. I mean, it's, it's negligible, no one's gonna notice. But, you know, if you're trying to transfer, you know, something that was gigabytes in size, then, you know, asymmetric encryption probably wouldn't be a very good choice because there will be um, performance impact. So, I mean, obviously it's gonna be a lot faster than it would have been when you're running like, you know, a Pentium 75 or a 386 or a 486, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think depending on the size of what's being transferred, there's going to be a noticeable difference between that and, and symmetric encryption. Right. Um, and just if you have any more questions, don't forget to just put them on the forums because we're heading to the end of this and we just want to make sure that George has time to, you know, enjoy his evening. Um, uh, just trying to find again questions that make any sense to me. There's actually some really good <laughs> questions in there that I, I, I kind of wouldn't mind um, if they were in the, like this, I can see the one, it's one about Casby there and um, there's a, a couple others like, um, cause they're very they're good, they're good questions. So please put them in there. Don't get asked, please put them in the um, in the discussion forum. And I have been going, um, I've been going through and trying to answer some of them in there, so. <laughs> well, if you see a question you want to answer, please let me know. Um, <laughs> because you're the boss and I don't understand what you're talking about. Um, so just trying to, you said something about CASB, so I think I'd, I'll ask them out. Um, do you usually see DLP CASB monitoring part of core or standard SOC capabilities for their add-on features? Um, 
depends on the organization. I mean, I, I've been working with uh, quite a few fairly large organizations at the moment um, and they do have a bit, and, and it depends on industry as well. And so because this particular organization I'm thinking of has a lot of very, very, um, you know, a lot of PII, um, it is part of their core um, uh, security operations center function to monitor CASB and DLP um like they they that's just one of their applications that's in their remit and they 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 closely monitor it because they have to because if they didn't and something happened it would be very very bad so once again it comes down to risk but i think in this instance it's a high risk they need kind of 24 by 7 monitoring um in which case you know it is in that case but then in some instances you know it might not fall part of the SOC. it might be separate and it might be a security team that just monitors it monitors it periodically mainly for compliance so then it might fall within that in that remit there so it just depends. Great. Um, just as a note, Hannah's just um, cutting off any questions that are asked after a certain time so that <coughs> we can finish up at some stage. Um, George, did you see any other questions that you thought were really valuable to answer right now? I'm just having a hard time deciphering them. Um, I don't think that would be fair because I'm like at the <laughs> bottom and then there's going to be heaps of them. Can we get like a um, like a kind of dump of these questions or do they just vanish? <laughs> no, we can, I think, I believe we can. Um, hopefully. And yeah, but anything, even at the bottom, just ask them away if you'd like, and then we can go from there. Okay, well, there's one here, like how can a network-based DLP detect the classification if the data is encrypted in transit? And um, the very, very, very short answer to that is SSL decrypt. So, um, that's, I mean, it's a good question. You know, if it's being secured and it's, it's encrypted in transit, then how on earth is anything meant to read it? Um, devices will typically decrypt the data, inspect it, re-encrypt it, and then send it on. So you'll see that a lot in things like, um, you know, for example, firewalls like Palo Alto, for example, they, they do that. They do it as SSL decrypt, they run that data across rules and they re-encrypt it and then send it on. So that's how you do that in a network-based DLP um, environment is to um, decrypt it um, temporarily. So, um, right. That's one that I just saw there. Um, um, we'll have time for one more question, I reckon, before we finish up, considering it's the day before a public holiday. Um, do you need to know all these individual? Okay, so these are some of the kind of examy questions. I mean, I haven't done the exam in quite some time. I just kind of broadly know the concept, but like from my experience, without kind of saying everything that was in there, um, the exam from me when I did it. Um, didn't go into like, and there's a couple of questions here around that. Um, it's kind of more knowing um, that the standards exist and what they're used for. For example, like we you know we talk about 888. I mean, there's heaps of special publications from NIST. Which one of those is the data destruction one? That's probably a good thing to know. Um, I don't think it's kind of go to the level of and how many passes are you going? And by, by the way, don't don't like shoot me if I'm wrong about this, but I, that's not my experience. Like it doesn't. I, I haven't seen it go to the level of. I don't think any exam that I've seen has really done that. Like, how many passes for like a you know solid state disk would you do if you're going to do this? Um, it's kind of more like, what would you go to to do this? Like, what what standard would you use versus what's in it? Um, same thing with you know cryptography. I don't recall any of the exams ever testing the math um, or knowing the algorithm. It's more so the con yeah the concept. So like, what is it? Which one would you use? Why would you use it? Um, you know, things around the key exchange, bit of that, but not the hardcore math. Um, just Hannah tells me we have time for a few more. Uh, just got to make sure that we read them out before you answer them so that everyone understands what's being said. Um, uh, for data destruction specs framework, do they cover data in uh, software as a service hosting as well. Any specific reference you would recommend? Thanks. Uh, where was that one? Uh, 758. Oh, got it. Yeah. Um, data storage favorite do they cover data in SaaS hosting as well? Um, I actually honestly can't remember. Um, most of the, so in terms of like the, and, and so, yeah, in terms of the SaaS stuff, um, most of the stuff that I understand in terms of data destruction in SaaS environments, I don't think it's really come from the specs of frameworks. It's more so come from, you know, knowledge from things like CSSP or CCSP. 
Um, so CCSP is going to, and, and to be honest, you know, doing this, the, you know, the CC, CCSP, which is a cloud, certified cloud security professional, practitioner, professional. Um, you know, when you talk about SAS, IaaS, PaaS, anything AAS, um, you know, the, the general best practice um, is crypto shredding. Um, so, you know, from my understanding, like I know that, you know, the DOD one and the ASD one from those specific data sanitization perspectives don't talk about that um, for cloud like that. They talk about the actual physical disk media and how to like wipe it. Um, whereas when we're talking about cloud, we talk about crypto shredding. Um, there probably is a little bit of it. And I'm even thinking about things like ISO. I don't, I don't think I saw anything in there either. It more talks about you should do this, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. Um, but yeah, look, if you're going to talk about SaaS, I'm going to go crypto shredding because that's the, the best practice. All right. Um, not many questions left and a lot of them seem really relevant only to a certain page. Um, uh, how does an organization place a dollar of value on a single piece of data and thus value something like a data set, database full of information? I saw that one. Um, yeah, value is hard. Um, uh, where is it? Here you go. What is the sensitivity of data? Which is no wait. Where is it? I saw that before. Eight thirty-two. Yeah, the times are good. Okay, there's always a place that all the other Yeah, so look, this is a, this is a tough one. So um, getting quantitative numbers is really difficult. Um, in a perfect world, you could get quantitative numbers for for most things, especially boards. Boards like quantitative numbers. It's like, well, what's this going to cost, or what is the impact of this? Whereas if you say qualitatively, oh, the risk is high, you get what does that mean? Um, so look, it really depends um, on, on what the information is. Um, it, it's, it's quantitative, but it's also subjective. Um, there are some like formulas for quantitative um, like risk analysis. Uh, do we cover those yet? I can't remember. I don't, um, I don't think we did. Oh, was that last week? Yeah, anyway. Um, that might've been last week to be honest. But um, look, I, I think a lot of it is um, you know, it's going to be research. It's going to be talking. Sometimes it's going to be talking to, you know, system owners to see if they know. But it, it, to be honest, it's going to be something that's really, really hard to get. I mean, there's going to be situations where, you know, you might be able to calculate what it would cost to rebuild it. Um, you know, there might be things we have to incorporate, you know, penalties if, if it were to get out. Um, you know, there's all sorts of considerations that, that, that um, need to take place there. But I, I honestly don't have a uh, a solid foolproof method for calculating what a piece of data is worth. So sorry, that's not overly helpful. Um, but yeah, a lot of the time it, it's really subjective and it comes down to knowing your data and knowing what it's worth, or at least being able to consult with people who can help guide you to understand what it's worth. Um, and usually, you know, losses are going to come into that um, and the penalties and things like that might be also considerations, but yeah. Great. Um, and uh, from 839, how do you effectively enforce DLP in bring your own device environments? Thinking of OneDrive sync on a bring your own device device. Uh, MDM, I mean, that's pretty much one of the ways to do it. So mobile device management. Um, so if there's an MDM platform that, um, and there's a few ways to do it. Um, you know, I know previously and still today, you know, containerization was a way to do that. Um, so, you know, for example, there's certain MDM applications, let's say mobile device management applications, they lay to containerize data so that you can't actually copy it out of the container. Um, they could do things like restrict copy and paste. They can do things like restrict things like open in other apps. Um, and nowadays, you know, there's even that kind of containerization where you, it's kind of invisible. So it's in a container, but it doesn't look like it. So the apps look like they're interacting with the rest of the device. Um, but, you know, once again, you can't open in other apps. Um, you can't um, copy and paste out of enterprise apps. So yeah, I think the answer is probably going to be uh, a mix of MDM and potentially um, CASB for where cloud is involved. Great. Um, just trying to see if there are any questions that haven't been dismissed that or 
that could be really relevant right now. Um, during mainframe decommissioning, do we need to achieve data destruction? I don't even remember having to decommission a mainframe, but I'm going to say wherever there is data that um, <laughs> that is stored um, and it is of a sensitive nature and there could be any you know, impact to that ever getting out, um, I would achieve data destruction. Um, like if anybody cares that anybody else, like if, if it's a value to, you know, to your organization or if there's a, a risk that it may cause some sort of negative impact, then I would, um, I would make sure it's destroyed. Great. Um, I think we've really reached the end of our time just to make sure that we're not um, taking up too much of your evening tonight. Is there anything else you wanted to cover before we wrap up? I'm good. You're good. You've said a lot. <laughs> Ready for a, a proper drink after this, I'm sure. Um, thank you everyone for attending and for George for giving us all this knowledge that I definitely don't understand. And for Hannah and Kit for um, answering a bunch of your questions on the comments section. We'll be back next week and you'll have Guy back, who's thankfully a little bit better at this whole, um, you know, at finding the right questions section. And we'll post any of these questions that we've got up to the forum so that we can get answers for them. But if you have asked a question and you'd like answers to it, please put them on the learn.itmasters.edu.au forums because as, Guy, as George said before, he'd love to see the responses to some of these. And, you know, there's there's a lot of really knowledgeable people in these, group, these groups here. So it'd be great to see people interacting on these. Um, we'll be back next week to give you more information. I'm assuming about, you know, number four of these standards. Uh, and that's about it. Thank you for coming. Thanks very much. All right. Bye all.